Hello there. Welcome to the Saroy channel. Thank you so very much for joining me this evening, wherever you are in the world. And I do hope you're doing incredibly well. And I want to send my love to each and every one of you. So much happiness for the new year that lies ahead of us. And let's hope it's going to be a very special one. So love to everybody. But before we get started, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Click the notification bell and the thumbs up. And let's get started with tonight's story. Dear Sarah and all your lovely listeners, my name is Bob and I'm initially from the bright, bustling, exciting city of New York, but I now currently reside in a rather small bungalow here in Charleston, Virginia, as I'm getting on in age these days, so I decided to move here after my wife passed away a couple of years prior due to a very bad attack of pneumonia. My strange and curious story begins in the 60s when I was a young man at the time and had been working in New York for several years. But my wife was very poorly and so was my son. When I say poorly, I don't mean physically sick by any manner of means, but the word I would actually use is failure to thrive. You see, my wife May was a very jittery, nervous kind of person who was terrified of any kind of social interaction and was quite reticent, reclusive and reserved and she preferred to remain almost invisible to the outside world. I think she'd grown up in a household with a misogynist father and believed that he incited in her a fallacious belief system that women were somehow inconsequential and had no real worth. She had adopted those self-effacing insecurities about herself which were invariably manifesting in her daily life and even rubbing off on our son. My son was very small for his age pale, puny and extremely underweight, with a very nervous, highly strung disposition, and he failed to interact at school with the kids of his own age, but would run away and hide so as to avoid any social awkwardness or interaction with any other kids. I knew something needed to be done about my small family because the surging apprehensiveness in their lives seemed to be escalating and was evidently diminishing the quality of their lives. I had attempted to send both of them for counselling sessions, but they had failed abysmally and only backfired on me because the situation at home got increasingly tense and my wife became much more uptight and began to cry a lot, and my skittish son would hide all the time, usually in the closet for many hours. So as you can imagine, I had reached the end of my tether as what on earth to do about my discomposed, troubled family. It was on an impromptu visit to my brother in West Virginia, on his little farm, that an idea was born. It suddenly occurred to me that the wonders of nature, coupled with fresh country air, could work miracles on my family and hopefully restore their confidence and their ailing health. I began to search for a local available farm to rent out for a year or so, depending on how well things went. I knew that I was not adverse to turning my hand to a little farming to pay the bills. Surely it was rather like mathematics, as once I knew the basics, what could actually go wrong? It would seem that I just could not find the perfect farmhouse, because everything that was being rented out was either far too big to manage, or not to my liking at all. In my profound frustration, I decided to take a long walk into the countryside, and I sauntered down several lanes, and came to a sign about rented accommodation of some sort, but I actually paid no attention to it, as I was so engaged and preoccupied by my thoughts over my poor wife and son and what on earth to do about them. In a trice I was standing on the edge of a dirt road, looking down upon an exquisite vervent valley, and in the centre of this valley was the most bewitching and beguiling farmhouse that I'd ever seen. It was surrounded by statuesque mountains in the far distance that rose up into the blue infirmament like masterful rugged giants. The landscape was immersed in a sumptuous rich carpet of green turf. Then there was the pretty pastures and the creme de la creme was a silvery lake that twinkled in the sunshine like a sparkling mesmerising silver jewel that seemed to shimmer and gleam, reflecting the entire valley on its surfaces like the most perfect mirage. This captivating lake was heavily flanked on its rear side by an impressive wooded area of statuesque, very imposing trees that I was to later learn was accessible to the locals in the area. I could see a few white-tailed deers bounding gracefully across the emerald green grass. For a moment I thought I was in a dream, and I rubbed my eyes several times, 
as I stared in wondrous awe at this ravishing scene unfolding before my eyes. Could this be real, I wondered, for surely I was staring at a piece of heaven itself. Imagine living on a farm like this, I thought to myself. It would be like a dream come true. I continued ambling along the country road, and that was when I observed a sign, Black Cherry Farm to Rent, Inquire Within, Speak to Mrs. White. All at once I realised to my astonishment that this dreamy, stupendous farmhouse was actually for rent, and my heart almost missed a beat, because I was so flustered with excitement. It was almost as if I'd been divinely led to this extraordinary, exhilarating place that was not too large for an uninitiated man like myself to manage. As I reached the farm gate, I encountered an elderly woman with a weathered face and a wrinkled skin with the palest blue eyes that I've ever seen. She appeared to be fixing the gate with a couple of tools. She was wearing a wide-brimmed hat and looked to be in her early seventies, but she seemed strong and robust, much like an ox. "'What can I do for you?' she asked me. "'I'm looking for Mrs. White,' I said. "'I'd like to rent out Black Cherry Farm.' "'That would be me,' she said. "'But how do I know I can trust you?' The last man who rented Black Cherry Farm did a runner after not paying rent for over a year. Never seen sight or sound of him since, and he made a mint from my farm and absconded with absolutely everything. Nasty piece of work he was, she muttered. I'm dreadfully sorry to hear that, I said. If it helps at all, I could pay a couple of months' rent in advance. The woman eyed me curiously, scanning me with her hawk-like eyes, much like an X-ray machine as if she was discerning whether she could trust me or not. I think you'll do, she said. But any funny business and I'll throw you out, understand, even if I have to chase you off Black Cherry Farm with my trowel. Of course, I said, I do understand. Now the land is rich for growing crops as the soil is excellent indeed, and the house is in remarkably good condition. There are also lots of free-range turkey around that you're very welcome to shoot. It does keep the populations down, because for some reason we have a lot of them. They taste delicious too, melt in the mouth they are, not like the ghastly stuff you buy over the counter. So fast forward a couple of weeks and I had thrown in the trowel in my city job, much to the horror of my wife, who thought I was barking mad to embark on such a spontaneous adventure. My wife and my son moved into this cosy, sumptuous farmhouse in West Virginia, and the metamorphosis I observed in my wife and child was considerable and almost immediate. My wife was so excited about her new country life here at Black Cherry Farm, and her former reticence and painful shyness seemed to evaporate as quickly as the steam from a kettle. My son got so enchanted and beguiled by playing outside, and he brought home tons of frogs, small fish and tadpoles in jam jars, and became so embroiled by the marvels of nature, which subsequently brought him out of his shell much like a tortoise who had been hibernating for far too long. In that moment I ascertained that I had indeed made a wise decision moving to the countryside and bringing my family to this idyllic part of the world. If that wasn't enough, my wife began making loads of friends at the local church, and my son began interacting with boys of his own age and having so much fun. I could only marvel at the miracles that were unfolding before my very eyes. Gone was the pale-faced, puny son I had once known. His rosy cheeks were now blooming, and my flourishing wife was also very different. She had become confident and assertive, and even her health had blossomed. Her skin glowed, and her brown eyes were bright, not to mention her hair possessed a healthy sheen. In truth, it was extraordinary, the transformation, and before long we became very settled and happy in our new abode. I soon became quite productive and effective in farming and managing the fields, even if I say so myself. I began to get my hands very dirty, but the fruitful results I yield made it worth my while, and the business boomed and became profitable. It seemed I was a natural at growing crops, and upon my wife's insistence we also introduced some free-range chickens to the land, for the purposes of eating, of course, but that never happened. We only ate their eggs, as my son had a name for every single chicken, and had grown very attached to all of them. 
and the thought of killing them was not acceptable as far as he was concerned, and if I so much as touch one of our chickens, that would definitely make me a murderer. One day I decided to try my hand with a bit of shooting, because I had observed a couple of very sizable wild turkey rustling around in the woods, and meandering along the fields of corn. They look good for eating. I rarely thought they would be a sumptuous, tasty treat for our dinner table. I was unseasoned, callow, and unpractised with a hunting rifle. I'd taken a shooting course for a couple of days that clearly did not go very well, because I have to admit, I was a lousy shot. My teacher refused to give me any more lessons, because he thought I was cack-handed and puerile with a rifle. He had lost patience with me, and suggested I quit while I was ahead. You really wobble too much when you hold the rifle, he told me, and you need a steady hand. If you keep jerking so clumsily like you do, there's no way you can be successful. You also need to remain still and focused, but you keep moving restlessly. A hunter needs to be very still, patient and focused, and quite frankly you lack the discipline required, and of course the coordinational skills. The animal you hunt will invariably just run away, because you keep drawing attention to yourself with your shuffling movements. It's like you're announcing your presence to all the animals. It's like you're saying, I'm here standing behind the bush. They're invariably going to just scuttle away before you have a chance to take anything down. I don't normally say this to my pupils, but I don't see in you the makings of a good hunter. What does he know, I remember thinking to myself furiously, feeling pretty frustrated with my teacher, whom seemingly had no confidence or faith in my ability to improve. Yet I had been assured by many hunters I had met that a little practice could work wonders, and I remember believing that to be the truth. I mean, how hard could it actually be to kill a turkey? It wasn't rocket science, was it? One hunter had actually assured me that it had taken him many years to acquire the skills to hunt like a professional. He also affirmed that I should not become intimidated by my teacher, who had a hardened reputation for being a cutthroat toughy in his attitude towards beginners. I rose very early one morning before the sun set over the horizon and quickly slipped out of our house, as I knew the earlier I got started the better, especially for a beginner like myself. So armed with my flashlight and rifle, I strolled into the forest and headed towards the spot that I had scouted the previous day. It was close to some oak trees where I'd heard the gobbling and scratching sounds, and through my binoculars from a fair distance I had also observed a couple of sizable turkeys pecking the ground hungrily looking for beetles and worms. I knew that this was the perfect quintessential hangout for an inexperienced hunter like myself who was clumsily tackling the ropes of hunting for the first time. I will admit that to date my amateur performance was rather like a bull in a china shop, but still I had the confidence to believe that with time and practice I was bound to improve. It would also be good to show off to May by bringing home a sizable looking turkey. Mrs. White had kindly informed me that for many generations those turkeys on the land seemed to roost around the particular oak trees in the wood for some reason. You could always find their feathers dropping and scratch marks in the area. It had indeed come to my attention that the turkeys had what I can only describe as a daily ritual or routine. I had observed them walking in a straight line on one of my cornfields in the very early hours of the morning. Yet I also perceived that in the heat of the day, when the temperatures escalated and soared, they seemed to enjoy seeking out the refreshing coolness of the woods. It was indeed a beautiful morning, and the sun was beginning to rise over the horizon in tangerines, golds, oranges and pinks, and the light shafts of the early morning sunlight danced on the forest floor in a fusion of different light shades, which made the forest take on a magical ambience. It was like the control of a radio had been switched on, because suddenly the forest became alive with pretty birdsong. I examined the area around the large oak tree, and sure enough there were the signs of fresh turkey scat in the area, along with loose feathers and scratches. I felt exceedingly confident that sooner or later the turkeys would emerge and make their presence known, so I settled down in a concealed hiding spot amidst some thick shrubbery for what was possibly going to be a long drawn out wait and began to drink my mug of hot coffee from my portable flask. I observed the tranquil, sweetened beauty of the forest, and felt an amazing sense of peace flood over my body. I could truly understand the appeal for a hunter. 
It was more than just gaining the trophy at the end of the day, but being in this relaxing environment surrounded by these tall, statuesque, imposing trees covered with bountiful layers of velvety green moss, with the floor also veiled in pretty green foliage, was just so enchanting and almost perfect. I waited for a long while and nothing happened, and I began to lose patience with a growing sense of frustration and irritation, I might add. When would the turkeys get here, I thought? I'd seen nothing all morning, apart from a beautiful doe with her sweet spotted fawn and a couple of squirrels darting up the trees, eyeing me with a keen interest. After a while I really got the strange, airy sense that someone or something was watching me, and it sent uneasy chills down my back. I knew this wooded area was accessible to some of the locals for hunting purposes, but I couldn't see anyone here. Hello, I called out. Is anybody there? Hello? Is anybody there? Is anybody there? My calls were met with a very firm silence, and there was no answer at all. So I told myself to stop imagining things and to focus on the job at hand. Suddenly I heard the gobbling sounds of the turkeys, and there was a large tom strutting his stuff to the less than impressed female hens, who pretty much ignored him. He was standing there proudly upright with his resplendent feathers fanned out to their max, much like a peacock, while he dragged his other wings on the ground. I noticed the fleshy wattles on his throat and neck and above the beak were bright red in colour. It was like he had only one thing on his mind, and that was to sow his wild oats, and so he was tirelessly trying to get the attention of the hens that were more intent on finding bugs than giving the impassioned Tom a second glance. I tried desperately hard to focus my rifle on the base of the Tom's neck and to line up my rifle with precision, but every time I tried to aim, my hands would shake violently as my rising excitement was reflected in my inability to keep still, and worse still, I began to rustle the foliage. I let out a few blasting shots that caused the turkeys to flee and scatter, making a raucous commotion, and my bullets failed to hit their target and were way off the mark. I failed abysmally at the task at hand and felt downcast and very disheartened. Suddenly I heard this very peculiar whooping laughter like someone or someone was chuckling, as they clearly thought I was an atrocious hunter and found my performance highly amusing and exceedingly entertaining. I assumed it was a local hunter having a good laugh at my expense, but what a strange laughter, I thought. I did feel very belittled and humiliated and quickly scurried away as fast as I could, hanging my head very low in shame. It affirmed what I had previously believed, that someone was indeed watching me while I'd been shooting. Whoever they were, they managed to remain very inconspicuous and aloof, and in my opinion, they had a hell of a nerve spying on me like that. When my wife greeted me after my hunt, she asked me about my turkey shoot. I told her that the turkeys had not made an appearance. I couldn't admit that I was such a useless, lousy shot as it made me feel emasculated and rather pathetic. Oh, that's terrible, she said. Never mind, I was hoping for that turkey dinner sometime. But next time, how about that? The following morning my wife was in a very good mood, bustling around the kitchen, singing happily to herself. You cheeky thing, she said to me, giving me a kiss on the cheek, making all that stuff and nonsense about not shooting the turkey. I found him on the doorstep where you left him. Wow, I was so impressed. That was some shot. He's a hefty fellow. Please will you do me the honours of defeathering him? I couldn't believe what I was seeing. My wife had brought in the tom that I'd tried to kill the previous day. She had found it on the doorstep. I discerned that this turkey had not been shot as my wife falsely believed. It appeared to have been strangled. I was bemused and bewildered, and more to the point, who was the mysterious hunter who had actually gifted me with the turkey, and how had he managed to kill it without a rifle? I was more than a little gobsmacked, and very perturbed. Every year, it would seem on my seasonal turkey hunt, the same thing would invariably happen again and again. I would misfire at the tom every single time, 
and my dreadful shots would cause the turkeys to make a thunderous commotion as they fearfully scattered. I would then hear the strange whooping kind of laughter, woo, 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 woo. and then the following day, as if by magic, the turkey that I'd failed to kill would be lying there on my doorstep in all its splendour. It was a mystery I was eager to solve, but was not something I was willing to share with my wife, who falsely believed I had become quite a hot shot at using a rifle, and had actually boasted to a friend on my supposed hunting prowess. I didn't want to admit my dreadful shortfalls in that regard, especially since my wife was enamoured by my success. One year I remember that as I was trying to take a shot at a rather big tom, suddenly this large hairy humanoid creature raced through the brush and dived upon the turkey so fast while he lifted the whole bird in his overlong arms and twisted its neck efficiently. I watched in stupefied awe and in utter reverence as the critter handed the turkey to me as if to say, see, that's how it's done. This astonishing creature had moved faster than a gunshot and had literally leapt upon the tom so fast that the bird had not even stood a chance and the death had been so swift masterful and effortless. I could tell that this critter, whatever it was, appeared to be smiling at me, and I knew at once that this was the mysterious hunter that had indeed been gifting me every year with turkeys, the very ones that I'd failed to kill. It was on this occasion he'd made his presence known to me, and I was utterly astounded. This creature was literally like anything I've ever observed before, and I have no idea what it was, but in truth I should have been intimidated and very fearful just by his mere appearance, because he was like a towering muscular giant, covered with long flowing dark hair that was neither brown nor black, it was a little between the both, and there was definitely a scattering of auburn in its tone. He stood upright like a man on two powerful legs, and was easily over eight foot tall, three foot wide, and about seven hundred pounds at a guess. Every part of his body literally rippled with muscle and his huge shoulders appeared to support a rather cone-shaped head. I think the creature's angular face and treacle-coloured eyes appeared to be so warm and congenial that I immediately felt comfortable and at ease in his presence. The creature pointed to my turkey and to the rifle and began to make that whooping, chuckling sound. I remember the strange laughter from my previous hunts. He then pointed to me and immediately imitated how I tried to shoot with my gun, and he began to shake his arms and pretended to take aim. His reenactment of me was so hilariously funny that even I began to laugh. It was so amusing, I literally could not stop. How long we both laughed, I don't know, but my gut was aching. Did I really look that atrocious when I tried to shoot? No wonder the creature had laughed at me. I could hardly blame him. The creature then made a chattering sound and pointed to the further forest and then he glided away. It was like he was telling me I need to go. I remember thinking, what the heck? Because I had absolutely no comprehension on what I'd encountered because in those days no one ever spoke about Bigfoot. But years later I realised that it was a Bigfoot that I had indeed encountered. While my family continued to rent out Black Cherry Farm from Mrs White, every time I needed a turkey, I would go to the forest with my rifle and I would wait for the turkeys to arrive to their roosting area around the oak trees. Every time without fail, the humanoid hairy creature would take down a tom for me with effortless ease and hand me the huge offering. He was indeed the finest hunter that I've ever seen in my life. He even left large fish on our doorstep from time to time, along with the occasional wild hog. I used to leave him gifts in the wood in return like a vast selection of fruit, most especially bananas and grapes, Kit Kats, peanut butter and bacon-flavoured potato chips, which he always heartily enjoyed. Every year I would get my turkey trophies from this creature, and it began the beginning of an unusual, firm friendship between a human and a Bigfoot for many years. I grew very fond of the creature who had a great sense of humour and was always warm and kind towards me. Although no words were ever exchanged between the two of us, as the critter would speak in a strange chattering sound like a monkey and make whooping sounds when he was laughing. Much of the communication between the two of us was acted out, seemingly telepathically, because I would sense what he was saying with virtual words that seemed to appear in my mind. 
One day he left our area for pastures green with a female Bigfoot to start a brand new family. So sadly I never saw him again and missed him terribly. But he was a wonderful creature whom I shall never ever forget. My wife has never known this truth about my turkey hunts and I shall never tell her either. And yes, the hunting teacher was right. I was a lousy hunter and I was never meant to hunt. So there you are. That's my story. What a lovely story. I do love the fact that you were so cack-handed at hunting and that the Bigfoot found that so terribly funny. He must have because they're so naturally good at hunting. So to see you wobbling around at the back of the bush and not being able to hold the rifle still, it just makes me laugh so much. I'm really sorry, but it does. It's hilarious. Thank you so much for sharing that incredible story. Until next time, goodbye. And good night.